Three more days. <laughs> Okay. All right. Hello. Welcome and happy NMO Awareness Month, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Samira and I am the founder and executive director of the Samira Foundation. I have been living with seronegative neuromyelitis optica since 2014. In celebration of our special month, I am pleased to introduce you all to Susanna Kahalen, best-selling author, journalist, public speaker, and I'd like to thank my new friend. Um, during our conversation with the celebrated author, we're going to learn about Susanna's journey to a diagnosis of a rare disease, her New York Times best-selling book, Brain on Fire, My Month of Madness, the importance of advocacy, and what it was like to have Hollywood's take on her story. Before I introduce you all to our special guest, just a few housekeeping items to address. Number one, this event is being recorded and will be available for replay on both TSF's YouTube and Facebook libraries. Um, number two, there will be a live Q&A towards the second half of our time together. So please don't be shy and populate your questions in the chat function and we'll get to as many of them as we can. And lastly, we are grateful to our partners, Horizon Therapeutics, Alexion Pharmaceuticals, and Genentech for supporting TSF's efforts for NMO Awareness Month 2022. And now without further ado, please join me in giving a very, very warm welcome to Noah, to Susanna Kahalen. Thank, <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. And just, I just want to say, you know, Samara, like getting to know you and getting to know the organization and, and about, and, and getting to know more about NMO, um, which was actually one of the illnesses that were um, uh, tested, that I was tested for when I was in the hospital. Um, getting to know all, has really kind of opened my eyes to a lot of things. I'm, I'm so impressed by the work you all are doing um, and impressed by the group you've put together and the support system that you have and, you know, the amazing kind of movements forward in the field. Getting a, getting a little taste of that through you and through this organization has been really a gift. So thank you so much for involving oh. me in this. Oh my gosh, Susanna, no, the pleasure is truly ours. And I have to share, it would be, um, it would be, I, it, it would just not be possible with, none of this would be possible without you. And you probably don't even realize that. When I got diagnosed, I was, I had just turned 25 and three weeks after I came out of the hospital, my friend was like, Samira, you need to read this book, Brain on Fire. And she's like, you have to read it. The girl, her vibrancy, her personality reminds me so much of you. And she went through something very similar and came out on the other side. Like I was really, really struggling at that point. And she's like, read this. And I read it and it gave me so much hope, Susanna, you have no idea. Like I saw you were my hero at that point in time. And I was like, if she can do it, I can do something too. And like, I got this motivation that I need to do something. And that's when I started the foundation. Wow. <laughs> I mean, you know, I don't, it's, that's, I'm speechless really, because that's more than I ever hoped I would do with this book. So, and it's, what is it, what it's amazing to me is when I was writing the book and the feedback I was getting from publishing was that my story was way too rare and that no one would relate to it and that it was something that was too specific. And what's been incredible about moments like this is that, you know, yeah, we've had, we have a lot of commonalities and we are in the rare, rare disease world, but we don't have the same illness. And the fact that we could relate so deeply to one another and my story could touch you and, and help in some way with you starting. I mean, that's amazing. And it's beyond what I'd ever dreamed really. Oh man. Yeah. I think your story resonates with so many of us. And like what you said, I mean, we don't have to have the same diagnosis. Like we, our experiences are so similar. I mean, even some of the treatments that we were on so similar steroids, IVIG, plasma phoresis, like so I feel like there's so much to learn from each other and we can inspire each other even without having the same diagnosis. 100%. And what's, what's been in kind of incredible to see is the book has reached people who are out, even outside of the rare disease world. Not only are they understanding a little bit more about what it's like to have a rare disease, which I think a lot of people who don't have immediate, they themselves are not affected or don't have immediate family members don't understand how lonely that place can be. But they also, what, what's, it's, it's kind of spread out to people saying, Oh, I was going through a bad breakup and you helped me through. I just, 
and that I was just like, I, it just never, it, it never occurred to me that this could kind of go outside of a very like insular group of people who had autoimmune encephalitis like me. Like that's who I was writing the book for really. And then the fact that other people, these different layers of other people have, have found something in it has been really the, probably the most meaningful thing in my life, really. Oh, we're, we're, and we're so lucky to have people like you on the planet. I think we need more of you. And uh, yeah, your story is incredible. And I think um, just personally for me, it, it, it provided a lot of hope and gave me this sort of signal that like, you can do something if you put your mind to it. And you did that. Yeah, <laughs> you did, you did. So I guess, you know, let's I mean, briefly talk about the diagnosis, like what, um, tell us a little bit about anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis. Sure. So it's an autoimmune disease, which I'm sure many of the people here are very familiar with the concept of what an autoimmune disease is. So I don't have to go into that, but in this case, the immune system targets and attacks, um, the NMDA receptors of the brain and the NMDA receptors of the brain are located all over the brain, but in high concentrations in the hippocampus and the frontal lobes. And so typically the way it initially manifests is very behavioral. So people will be psychotic and, um, delusional and, and, and actually, you know, hallucinating. And as it evolves, there's a lot of abnormal movements. There's eventually comatose coma and death. Um, but yeah, so is it, there's a, there's a very quick trajectory. Um, it's more considered an, an acute autoimmune disease as opposed to a chronic one. Um, though seronegative questions, which I know, you know, you know, that world very well. There's a question is, can someone have um, kind of a lower grade version of what I had and live with it and not know it? Um, and that raises some serious questions about what does, you know, diagnosed as a serious mental illness, like, like schizophrenia, but I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. So that that's basically what the diagnosis wow. is. Yeah. And Susanna, if I remember correctly, you were one of the earlier people to get diagnosed. And after your story came out, your story was able to help identify thousands of other patients, right? I mean, definitely. I, I think, uh, yeah, I think it's fair to say. Basic. When I was diagnosed, I was the 219th person in the world to ever get the diagnosis because that it was only discovered in names in 2000. It was 2005, the first paper of, I think, 10 people came out. 2007, it got its name. And I was diagnosed in 2009. So very early days. It didn't mean it wasn't around. It, you know, the doctors that I've spoken to think it's been around for pretty much forever. Um, and then, you know, after what was happening is the field was expanding. My book came out. Both those things were happening at the same time. And um, what, what my book did that the field itself couldn't perhaps do, and the, which is the power of story, really, um, was it reached lay people or reached people in the medical community who wouldn't necessarily be reading neurological journals and know about the cutting edge of neuroscience, you know? So, you, you know, I was reaching kind of nurses and nurses assistants and even, you know, emergency room doctors. And so that, I think, probably had the most profound effect on, in terms of my effect on the field, was the was a the lay public and the kind of medical, you know, uh, you know, physicians and clinicians who would not necessarily have known about this rare illness without the book having read it. I think. Um, and just to paint a, I guess, a fuller, a fuller picture of what a, a patient's life looks like, a patient suffering from that too. What specialists are involved in your care because it's acute? Like, do you um, still deal with anything now? Or are you on long term medication? So, like, what does that sort of look like? Well, you know, in, initially when you're diagnosed, um, the, there was, I mean, there was a team when they were investigating, it was name a doctor, you know, we had rheumatology, we had psychiatry, we had neurology, we had everything in between cardiology, every, cause everything was really being affected because the whole brain was really, um, being, being altered and they, they were searching, you know, um, when I got my diagnosis and again, very early days, really the care went down to neurology, epileptology slash, cause our seizures involved. Um, and psychiatry. So those were the two main areas that I would, that I was interacting with because I was on a lot of antipsychotic medication. I don't think I would be on any of those drugs had I been diagnosed now. They just didn't know what to do. I was, I mean, we can get into that. I mean, the symptoms, but I was, you know, I was extremely delusional and psychotic and, and, and even violent really. Um, and so that psychiatry really was into kind of managed behavior and, you know, in the recovery stages, which 
at that time, no one really knew where you were in the stages of recovery. Could you recover fully? Like, would you regain your cognition? Question mark, question mark, question mark. And there was also a lot of therapists, you know, occupational speech, et cetera, which, um, which were involved at, the, at that stage. And now, um, because that was an acute, and I was, I would say safely say I was fully cured, I guess if you want to use that word, um, I'm not, I'm not on any medication. Um, I, I think it took me probably, I would say, I mean, I was off any of the medications I was on a year after my diagnosis. Wow. A year and a half, maybe. And I would, I would say maybe, probably a year. And then I would say it took me another half year or more. I don't even know. It's hard to say It's because I'm sure everyone here knows some of these parts of are very hard to tell with yourself, you know, like where you are and how you're doing. It's sometimes hard to self-assess. Um, but I would say at least, at least another six months after that took me to kind of recover my cognition enough to be able to write the book and stuff. Yeah. What would you say uh, were like the top five symptoms that were most prevalent with this? I mean, they're all, they're all, you know, psychotic psychosis related. Um, they're the most robust people really notice them first. So I can talk about, you know, in the beginning before, as it was kind of smoldering, if you want to go with the brain on fire, mm -hmm. um, metaphor, um, it was, I was actually, my, I presented as, um, kind of depressed. I, I was, I had a very low energy. It was very, very, I was, I, I didn't have any drive. I, I just was tired. I felt like I was sick and I actually went to a doctor, a neurologist, um, at that point, because I also had one-sided numbness, which was an early symptom, which was with that, you know, one side in anything is always concerning. So I went to a neurologist at that point and, and he, the first misdiagnosis that I got was mono because that's how I kind of presented. I was really lethargic. And as that was about a month, probably of that. And then after that presented, then the psychosis started to come in and it came in like really fast. It was like one day I was tired all the time. And the next day I was completely manic. I mean, talking a mile a minute you know, kind of aggressive, grandiose, um, also just rapid mood changes. Like I'd be so happy, the happiest I'd ever been. And then I'd be hysterical. And shortly thereafter, I started having seizures. And that was another big, big symptom was seizures, which I think really probably saved my life because the seizures, A, made uh, medical intervention, you know, necessary earlier. Um, and also it, it kept me out of a track that could have been harmful for me ultimately, which would be just on the psychiatry track. Not to, you know, there are plenty of psychiatrists now who identify this. And a lot of people who are identifying this are psychiatrists, but at the time it would have been a hard road for me to get back. Um, so that the seizures kind of kept me out of that as well. Um, yeah. And then as, as I was hospitalized, the behavioral side of this, like ratcheted up and ratcheted up until I completely declined into catatonia. Oh my God, scary. Well, I'm so glad you're better now and you know that's all behind you but you just triggered a, a question so like you many of us go to the ed like 10 times before fi finally someone takes us seriously because a lot of these doctors don't know what exactly to look for they don't know to look for nmo because it's so rare so many of us have been discharged from ed visits saying oh it's you know you're exhausted or you're just dehydrated or you're just stressed or you're having a panic attack i can't tell you how many times i heard i was having a panic attack. really can i yeah. ask about this i mean yeah. okay a what what are the symptoms that made them think it was a panic attack like what would they what, what was it what did they see that they were identifying as I can only speak for my experience, but I actually got discharged twice when I was actually having a relapse as a panic attack. And my symptoms were like, my vision was going in and out. I was just so tired. My hands were shaking. I couldn't feel my feet. The left part of my body was numb. And this was in a situation where they didn't know to look for that. They didn't, they just were like, oh, this is a 25 year old, perfectly healthy young girl who's very fit and she's probably just having a lot of drama in her life or something or freaking yes. out about the other totally. you know, they didn't think to do an MRI they didn't think to do a lumbar puncture they didn't even do an MRI at that point when you were doing that oh, were yeah doing that. like those panic attack visits yeah they were just like oh you're just really tired and I was like 
Uh, I don't think so. Like, well, I am really tired, but there's yeah, yeah. exactly. So, so, you know, in your story, you talk about those periods of times when, you know, people around you, what they just kind of thought you were going through something or you were just stressed out about work or a relationship. Like, w- can you share a little bit about that? Like how frustrating that was for you? Absolutely. I mean, initially, <laughs> When in the, in the early stages, uh, I had good friends n- noticing something was wrong. And mm. the prevailing idea was I was having a break. Like I was having some kind of nervous breakdown. That was like the fear. And that, I mean, to the point where my, at work, which was the, where a lot of my friends were, it was a very high stress environment in, in a newspaper in New York. And they actually pulled my personal file to, to contact my parents. Cause they were really that concerned by my behavior. But um, as I started going to physicians, you know, the first di- misdiagnosis was mono. And then, the, and, and meanwhile, I was getting MRIs. My MRIs were just clean. They were just totally clean. So they weren't revealing anything. Um, then I, when I went to one doctor who's considered one of the best in New York City. He's affiliated with a very fancy institution. And he wasn't, he, you know, and I'm not generalizing here, but I'm just giving the facts. He was an older guy who I think was a little bit behind the times. And also I come in as a 24 year old, 25 year old, maybe, was I 25? I think it was 24, 25. (laughs) Um, And, you know, didn't fit in with this clientele. Most of the clients, as we all know in neurology or tend to be older, they're older than us typically. Mm -hmm. And I think he was just kind of like square peg round hole. And he thought this woman's partying too much. She's living too big of a life. And so he, you know, he was interviewing me and he was already at something called the clinical gaze where he had already decided I looked like something, I acted like something. So I was something. So he had actually written down, he misheard what I said about drinking. He'd asked me how much am I drinking? And I had said about, about two glasses of wine a night. And he had written down two bottles of wine per night. And that was a reflection of what he was his, whatever he was stereotyping me or whatever, however he was seeing me, his, you know, the way he was seeing me was actually changing the way he was listening to me. And that's what he saw. Um, And that followed me. I mean, it luckily didn't follow me. um, It didn't completely derail everything, but, you know, partially probably because toxicology came back negative and all these things. But uh, I, you know, basically in the beginning, that was the kind of in my chart. So that was what people were thinking in a way, like maybe she's a drug addict or, you know, not to say it's someone who uses drugs can't get a rare disease too, you know, which is another thing that if, you know, you're kind of damned by proximity to something like that. But I, you know, that wasn't the case with me. And, but he still had seen me in that way. And it really shaded the way that he was even listening to me. Oh, I'm wow. sure there are plenty of stories within your community about that too. And, you know, when you were talking before, I was thinking, is there, do you have any kind of sense of like how many times people go to the doctor, like how many years go by or months go by until diagnosis, or is it very variable? It's super variable, but I got to tell you, which it was, you know, part of my interest in talking to an author about this. So storytelling is such a big part of what we do at TSF. When I started this foundation eight years ago, you know, I had never even worked for a nonprofit. I had been never been sick in my life and blah, blah, blah. But I was newly diagnosed, not shy and thought to myself, hey, If I share my story, that means more people will hear about it and more people will likely donate to research. And then research is what will get us a cure. That was my thought process. I was like, this this is a simple math equation. So then I was like, hey, why don't we multiply this? And that was the first program that we did with the foundation, which is the first, the longest duration program. And it's still standing. It's called Voices of NMO. That's crazy. This two months after the foundation started, and it's basically this it's a storytelling platform from everyone impacted by the disease. Because when you get a rare disease, it's not just, it doesn't only affect the patient, it affects their families, their friends, their colleagues, the nurses they work with, the doctors they see. Like it touches everybody. So it's a great program that we have. And we have about 120 stories in our library now from all different perspectives, few different languages, super, super, super cool. But that's why we have so much respect for someone like you who took your story and like brought it to the next level. And so what I wanted to tell you about the program, which your question is that 
I edit every single story personally, even though we're getting so big, that's something I want to hold on to. I'm delegating a lot of things and I'm like this, I want to hold on to this because I get to read every story and learn something new every time. And one of the things I have learned profoundly over the last eight years is how many years people go with being dismissed from the medical system with the wrong diagnosis and with such little support, sometimes all three at the same time. Yeah, 100%. And so it's a long-winded way of saying in our community, it is not unheard of that you go years on your living on your own with this in your own head with people telling you it's not real or telling you it's something completely different. What do is, is MS, MS is the diagnosis most often it's misdiagnosed for, are there yeah. other diagnoses that are in the kind of world of the orbit? Yeah. Yeah. So there's, um, there's MOG AD, which is myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein antibody associated well, disorder. You have to learn. Hey. Oh, I'm proud of uh, that is hey. extremely <laughs> impressive. Like, I'm glad this is recorded because that was really good. <laughs> It was it's like a rap impressive. song every time. It really was. <laughs> the things you have to, the things you become proficient in and the, the words that you learn when you have a rare disease are, it's pretty astounding, I have to say. And actually like, you're like, pat on the back. I know that exactly. word. You know? <laughs> so funny. Yeah, so there's that. And then there's ADEM, there's AFM. MS is the biggest one. A lot of people get checked for lupus, for Lyme, for scleroderma, for Bichette, for vasculitis, for cancer. Wow. I mean, they check everything. And, uh, you know, in a lot of autoimmune diseases, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm just curious. Please. Okay. A lot of, okay, are the, a majority women, right? Is it the same with this as well? Yes, definitely more women than men. And are there also um, other autoimmune diseases that come with it typically, or is it you stand on its own? Um, it's usually standalone. However, I will say another thing that I learned through all these stories is that a lot of our patients also have secondary autoimmune diseases too. And we're not sure if they develop before or after or at the same time. I definitely can't speak to that. But mm -hmm. something I see a lot of is NMO and RA, NMO and lupus. Mm -hmm. um, there unfortunately is also NMO and cancer, but, but NMO and like MS, not a thing. Mm. Is the NMO and cancer a similar thing with the illness that I have? The original was perineoplastic syndrome where you would usually be, there would be a tumor, sometimes cancerous and the body would direct antibodies to fight the cancer and get confused and start attacking the brain. That's kind of what the original idea behind this illness class. And now that's, that's kind of not, this, you know, I didn't have a tumor. A lot of people don't have tumors, but is that this kind of similar thing with NMO? I really don't know, to be honest. Like recently there was an article about Epstein-Barr virus being linked to MS. And this is like unlocking a huge amount of information and Epstein bar has been linked to because so, you know I was talking in the beginning about how I had like um those kind of mono like symptoms was, I definitely had a virus that kicked things off that was a trigger and Epstein bar apparently is one of the viruses that have been known to trigger um uh, an NMDA I think I'm sure and I'm sure it's also a trigger for a lot I wouldn't be surprised if a few years from now they say that it's somehow linked to NMO and MOG. who knows but one thing's for sure it's it is linked to MS so I think that is going to like open a door to just so much more information even if not to Epstein-Barr but maybe another virus or something I had a really bad infection before I lost my vision interesting yeah. And I think a lot of people in our community, if they look back, maybe it's a coincidence, maybe it's not, but a lot of people have these kinds of flus or viruses or infections right before their, the onset of their illness. Wow. We may have just found a cure. I think we just figured this out. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? But yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just happy that the scientists are looking into it. But I wanted to go back to your story real quickly. So you... Um, you know, supporting characters are such a big part of any story, but our lives too, especially when we're going through something like this. And you're from a reader and viewer's perspective, I would say you had a fantastic support system Absolutely. who were advocating on your behalf when you couldn't speak for yourself. And um, how different would your, like that's Dr. Najjar, your family, 
your boyfriend, your colleagues, your boss, your friends, like how different would your life be in that circumstance if you didn't have that? Oh, uh, I don't, you know, it's, I, I actually do have a sense of what it would, would have been like, because um, through my experience in sharing my story, I've obviously had a lot of contact with people who've had autoimmune encephalitis. And I actually, my second book, I wrote about this uh, woman I called kind of a mirror image, kind of a distorted mirror image. And she was the same age, kind of similar profile, similar, actually, and, and actually kind of similar family support, apparently. Um but she went mis- was misdiagnosed and was in and out of a psychiatric hospital with a with schizophrenia. And um, by the time I actually did a grand rounds at the psychiatric hospital, and um, that was about two years after her symptoms first, um, you know, revealed themselves. And um, they finally tested her after our after our grand rounds there, and she had autoimmune encephalitis. But from what I understand, I, I was in contact with her doctor for a little bit after that. And it seemed like she probably would never recover her co- cognition to the same degree that I did. And he said, you know, he said basically that she would be a permanent child, which is, you know, so I see this other world that could yeah. easily have happened, especially had I not had the support system that I did, because I mean, I was telling doctors that I have multiple personality disorder. That's what I was saying. So I was not my own advocate at all. And, you know, th- there were some things that happened that um, had my parents not a, been there every day in the hospital. Someone was with me almost at every hour. Um, they were switching off and there was a real team mentality about being just being physically present, which I think is anyone who spent a long time in a hospital, which again, a community of people I think can probably relate. Um, it's so important. These hospital systems are bureaucracies and they're going to allocate resources where it's needed or required or they're being seen. And if you're not being supported um, visibly, it's something you sometimes can get forgotten about or dismissed more easily. So, you know, just even having them physically in the room with me was, was huge. Um, wow. Definitely. And then, you know, they were able to advocate for me. They were, they, you know, just in a very, in even, even kind of like in a basic way, like they spoke the language and they were able to, in, you know, interact with the doctors directly and push back. And they were able, they felt comfortable asking questions, which not everyone does, you know? So I, I, yeah, with the kind of short answer is like, I, I definitely would not be here had I not had that support system. Wow. That's powerful. Are you still in touch with your doctor? Yes. Yeah. He's actually going to, at the AAN, he's going to be, oh, Yes, yes. So he's That's gonna awesome. Yeah. Oh my God. What a special human, right? Oh, the best. He's, he's absolutely, he, it's, you know, it's funny. My mom called him Dr. House because he's you no know, brilliant, but he's the nicest guy, you know, like Dr. House. I don't know how many people actually, it's kind of an old reference now. It's kind of funny, but um, you know, he's kind of curmudgeonly and mean and Dr. Najjar is the absolute opposite. Opposite. You just want to hug him. He's just so wonderful and um, caring and kind and just like everything you think about in terms of good clinical care is not just about knowledge or being aggressive with treatment and being confident. It's actually really also just about touching the patient and looking at the patient in the eye and being going person to person and interacting with the caregivers in meaningful ways and right. listening and he has all that in spades. It's, you know, you know, unfortunately a lot of emails that I get now um, are from people looking to connect with Dr. Najjar and I can't do that for anyone. And, you know, I I know it, his role has kind of gone, you know, he, unfortunately sometimes the better doctor you are, the higher you start climbing in the world and the less patients, the fewer patients you see. So, which is a sad thing, but, um, so I, I know that, you know, a lot of people are kind of desperate to see him, but, but I do say Dr. Jar is not the only great doctor out there. He's exactly. not the only, I mean, I'm sure among the people who are here right now, can we can draft up a list of some great freaking doctors, you know? So for me, he was the person who saved my life and I think he's the best doctor, but I know mm-hmm. that there's, there are a lot, there are so a lot of not great ones. Yeah. There are, there are quite a few bad ones and there are also quite a few great ones. There really yeah. are. And, um, I'm sure you have a story of a great doctor oh. who entered your orbit too. Oh, I have to tell you about him. I mean, I will say this, we don't have that many true dedicated NMO and MOG specialists, but the ones that we have, they're in it to win it. 
And all of them, it's like all of these NMO doctors I'm meeting, especially now around the world, every time I get off of a call with them or meet them in person, I was like, these people, they're committed to the cause. Oh, I love it. Love are that. They, are they mostly at Mayo and NIH or are they spread There are out? several um, centers of excellence now. And actually the doctor I want to tell you about, um, he's here in Boston at Mass General Hospital. So um, I would say the like OG NMO center was at Mayo Clinic mm-hmm. um, and Hopkins, but now there's one here at MGH. Oh. Uh, Stanford has one, UCLA, UCSF, UT Southwestern, Cleveland Clinic. I mean, we, we're starting to see a lot more. Is there, course, is there one in New York? Just so if anyone ever- Oh, yes, of course, yeah. NYU Langone. NYU, okay, good. Okay. NYU good. has actually, facts, Susanna, the largest NMO clinic in the country. What? Okay, good. This is good. You know, I'm going to, I might ask you after this to um, send me some- Yeah. Yeah. You probably have this somewhere, but I want to, I'm going to start, I'm, I'm, my website's very simple now, but I want to do like some resources stuff, especially with people sure. I work with and just be able to, I just will connect to you. But if you have something that you specifically sure. you know about, I would love yeah. that. That would be okay. awesome. But we have a Dr. Najjar too. His name is Dr. Michael Levy. And he is, I mean, I'm sure everyone in the audience loves and knows Dr. Levy, oh. even not their doctor. He is like our NMO mob papa bear. And oh. he's worked at the Hopkins NMO clinic, was part of building that. And now he built the one and is developing the one here in Boston. But he is everyone's NMO doctor, basically. Oh that guy started a Facebook group and he will directly answer patients' questions without giving them like medical advice. Yeah. Like, you know, he's a sounding board that has been tremendously helpful to our community. Person. He loves the patients. He is completely patient-centered. He dedicates his any free time that he has to research. Um, he's just an amazing guy. We're so- People who that. should be more people out like in the world. Like, I mean, I, I mean, that is just takes another level of- Commitment. cool. Wow, it's that's amazing. amazing. Yeah. He will be at AAN. I will be sure to introduce oh, you. Oh, please do. I would love to meet him. That's wonderful. He's that a very, wonderful. very special guy. And also, we're so lucky. He's the chair of our medical advisory board. <laughs> oh, that's great. So you got, you yeah. got the best, pretty much, it sounds like to the me. Best. He's the yeah. best. I'm sure everyone in the audience loves Dr. Levy. Oh. But um, so to your book, oh my gosh, how did this happen? Oh my gosh. So I, so I get my diagnosis when I'm in the hospital. I, like I said, it was 219. Um, so when someone says, to, and I'm sure because so much has changed with NMO within the time that you've been diagnosed, oh, there was basically, you, you, you had said me previously that you thought you were going to die. Yeah. That was the, that was the path for you. For sure. And, you know, I had a kind of similar experience with my diagnosis. You know, basically there was no natural history because it was so newly discovered. So there was, there was no course, like, would you die or not? Would you be able to read a book again or not? Would you, you know, be able to drink liquids on your own? You know, would you be able to talk again? You know, like all these questions, or would you be able to drive a car? And then I get, you know, the, the kind of questions started getting more and more sophisticated as the thing time went on. So when I started reading again, and because when I left the hospital, I could not read, I could not, I could barely talk. I could barely walk. And Things happened really fast. I got plasma phoresis um, a few times. I got IVIG treatment a shit ton of times. And I got, um, I had, I had, I had intravenous steroids and then I also was on prednisone. Oh my God. That was my, that was, that was the cocktail, Um, which now they tend to do rituximab and kind of chemotherapy drugs. I probably would have gotten that then, but they didn't know they weren't using that at the time. So, so crazy. We use rituximab heavily in our community. Doesn't surprise me at all. Yeah. Rituximab is really interesting. It's a tough drug. I know I, from what I understand to be on, I can, for some people it's pretty, it's hard to tolerate, but I think it's pretty incredible what it can do. Um, I know some people who have more of a, a chronic condition, chronic form on this, so the zero negative side, and they have to get infusions of, of, of rituximab or a, 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 a kind of medication like that. Wow. You know, every, every few months, um, so many parallels their lives. Yeah. Um, so I get out of the hospital again, no natural history. I'm told I should do speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy. That's pretty much it. And, you know, I see my doctor once a week and they are tapering, they tapered me down off of the prednisone and the antipsychotics kind of very, very, very slowly. 
And the question was, what's next? And so I spent my time eating a lot of uh, mint chocolate chip ice cream. <laughs> I was really into that. I, uh, and steroids are so wonderful for gaining weight. I <sighs> bar heavy antipsychotic drugs that I was on. So that was great. Um, and I also just like watched friends and sat around, um, you know, just waiting to see if my life was going to start again. And, you know, bit by bit, things started to come back. I started writing again. I kept a journal, you know, things started to loosen up about, I would say eight months after my diagnosis, I, I went back to work and, um, I was not ready to go back to work. I was like, I, in a way, like, I wish I could have been a little bit kinder to myself. Like, that's the way I am. I like, I, I kind of am a little like, you know, I, I need goals and, and I wish I had made more internal goals that were like, this sounds silly, but like things that would be like learning to sew or learning to cook or, you know, something that I could, that would enrich my life that I don't have an opportunity to do now that I'm back in the grind of things. And I wish I could have just given myself that moment to like find something that makes me happy without mm -hmm. having any necessary greater goal. I don't know, but, um, I went back to work. The, the paper was very kind to me. Like they, they threw me like the easiest stories, like the hottest bartender in New York city. You know? <laughs> and so I did that for a while. And like my editor was editing me heavily. My friend was like over my shoulder. You know, it was, they were so sweet. And they like, didn't move anything from my desk. You know, I was gone for nearly a year and, and, and they, they really took care of me. And, um, it was around that time. I'm starting to get my groove back. Dr. Najjar has a grand rounds about my case at NYU. And he invites me and a, a reporter friend of mine at the paper and my, and one of my editors came to the grand rounds as well, as well as my family. And I remember we like got there late because there was traffic it's in New York city and we, we run in and it's like this piece of brain is on like he's like looking at this inflammation in this brain. And I'm like, is that my brain? Cause I had a brain biopsy. I'm like, is that my brain? I don't know. Cause I, we'd start, they had started before we got there. And at the end he said something about, and she's this, you know, 24 year old New York post reporter is now back to whatever. And so I was like, you know, this was about me. And um, I kind of was talking to my, my colleague at the paper and telling her about it. And she's like, you have to write about this. And I, I have to say on some level, I had hoped someone would identify it as, as something that was meaningful beyond just my experience that had some kind of interest. And so when some, when someone kind of gave me that permission, I thought I, I want to do this. Like I, this is something I wanted to do anyway, but I just wouldn't allow myself really to even go there. And so I went to my, at my direct editor and told him about it. And he said, that's great. Like it's due Friday. And it was Tuesday. And I just, worked really hard on that, got so much wrong. Cause my, I didn't remember, I don't remember a good deal of what happened to me. Um, cause it affects actually memory centers of the brain too. So I, you know, in shaping it, there was a lot of false memories or a lot of things that I later would learn were wrong, but I did it. And I did this, I think they called it my lost month of madness because it's a tabloid in New York city. Anyway, so that came out and the emails flooded in. And then I was on the today show and the, and people from all over the country, all over the world were emailing me, getting diagnoses from it, thinking they maybe had it, you know, searching for answers, really flooded. No other article that I'd ever written had gotten that much response. Oh and, my gosh. Yeah. And um, I knew I had to do something more. And I also just wanted the opportunity. Once I had started digging into this time, I remember, I don't remember anything from it. It's very disturbing to lose such a large chunk of time. And even if you remember when you're sick in the hospital, it's really lost time too. And so That's excavating true. that became also something that I wanted. I wanted to do that. And so this gave me the opportunity to do that as well as this kind of, I knew that I had to do it because this was not being talked about. No one knew about it. People were underdiagnosed. At the time when I was diagnosed, Dr. Nizhar represent like estimated that 90% of people were going misdiagnosed with the illness. So it, it felt like a moral imperative to do it. And then I also a personal, like selfishly wanted to do it. So those two things aligned. And then I, um, I started, I, well, I wrote a proposal, which I'm happy to talk specifically about how these things work. You know, um, if anyone, if anyone's interested in this process, but I'll skip through it. If anyone wants to ask, they can, you write a proposal, you send it out all publishers, but one rejected it. Um, for the reason I said before, it was too rare. 
Um, I got, I had one interest at, at um, Free Press, which was later Simon and Schuster, and they gave me a year to write it, and I wrote, and I wrote it in a year, and um, it came out, and it was just the the publisher did not expect the response. I did not expect the response, and it kind of took off in a way that I I could absolutely never have dreamed. That is so cool. <laughs> that is so cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's cool. It's amazing. What an amazing story. Okay, so th- for me, it's the big pink elephant in the room. What is it like to have Tyler Perry involved so intimately <laughs> in your story? Tell us oh, so weird. I mean, what came to you? Yeah. So, but you were referencing Tyler Perry. I have never met Tyler Perry, unfortunately, but um, there was a movie made about the book, which was an, a very, with perspective, I'm just very grateful for it, but it was a kind of a hard, I, I don't want to say hard because it sounds so, because they're way hard as we all, again, no, that's not hard. Um, but I have to say letting go of um, control over this time that I lost control. So like I kind of created this artificial control, like imposing a narrative on being sick. So I created this narrative and I put that over being sick. And all of a sudden I felt like I could control it. And then I just handed it to someone else and had no control again. And so, and, and unfortunately the person who, who directed and wrote it was, he, it wasn't my favorite collaboration, but, but um, so seeing it was like, and I didn't care if they, if it was changed, it was actually very, very, very close, but almost like I've used this analogy in the past. It's kind of like looking in the mirror and like missing a nose, like just off. You're like, oh, this is too close, but also too far, you know? So it was a very weird experience, but, but, a, but a wonderful one. I mean, I could ne- again, another thing that I could never have conjured up in my wildest dreams that this horrible, terrible, frightening, you know, completely self-obliterating time would be made into a movie um, and would have Tyler Perry in it. And <laughs> the mom, you know, it was from Matrix. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> she was awesome. I did meet her. She was lovely. Um, and um, so I just, I, I could never have, I could never ever have. So it was a surreal experience watching someone play you during a time you don't remember. And so that you've recreated in a book through the eyes of others, because I used, I had to interview everyone to create what was in the book. I don't know how to say that, except out of body, like completely out of body experience. I can't even imagine. I will say, even after reading your book, I feel like I knew you personally, because you're, you're very, very vibrant, even at your lowest low, it translates very well from your writing, like who you are, you're like, just amazing. And, and then I watched the movie, and I was like, wow, I feel like Chloe Moritz did a really good um, job. She did. It. She did. I think she's wonderful. And she's, she's another person who was just like, it was great to, she was really, I think she seemed like she really wanted to do the story justice. And she seemed like she read about the, she actually read about the illness. I think she's like, looked how to have a seizure. Like she really like did her work. You could tell. On it. So she, yeah, I was really, really happy with, with her and, and how that worked. I mean, it was, a, it, again, like I, it's a hard experience of letting go. Um, yeah. but, and so I, I think I had a little bit of like growing pains with it, like, mm, you know, but now I just, am just like completely kind of perplexed and dazzled and like amazed by the fact that it happened, you know, what, is there anything that the movie got wrong? Yes. This is something I thought a little bit. This is, okay. part of my, I did not like that at the end they made me her walk with a cane. Yeah. Because I never did. And I thought, okay, they can't get their mind around something that's invisible. Yeah. And I also felt they gave real short shrift to the recovery part of things, which for me was the most meaningful part of the book. And the most difficult experience was not necessarily the height of the psychosis or the height of the illness, but it was that, that time in between I had no idea where I was on that line of recovery. If I'd ever be the same person I was before, of course I wouldn't because you're never the same, something this big happens to you, but would I ever be able to write again? Would I be comfortable making small talk again? Like all these questions. And, and I heart, I know these are internal things and they're more philosophical, but I was like, I don't, you've seen the movie. It's like, like 
She has a yeah. cannon. Okay, then she's better. Yeah. I was just like, I, I begged them just do like a montage of like different things and I can give you stuff that, and, and they just wouldn't budge on it. And I was a little bit disappointed with that, but. I, understandably, I think that that's yeah. valid. Um, I think maybe for the theatrics, they had to focus more on the other part, but I hear you. I would feel the same way. Yeah. Because it's, it's like, important. Totally. And listen, I think the, the sickness part of it helps people in so many different ways. It unlocks so many different things, but it's like your story really started when you started to recover. Mm-hmm. I feel that way about me too. Like yeah. NMO happened. And of course it's happening behind the scenes on a much le- like less severe scale for me now. But I feel like my story is not that I have this disease. It's what I did with it after. And I feel like that's the same with you. You know, I just got chills from that. I never thought about why that really annoyed me so much. I mean, yeah, a lot of it, and you know, the fact that you had to rise above and do all the, you know, it, I thought it like made the ending cheaper. Because yeah. It was like just walked out and then she's better. It's like, well, then where's the, where's the trial here? You know, totally. so that was what I thought just like, I, I honestly thought like in terms of how the story's written, it's actually doesn't do service to the story, but I think you're hit on something that maybe I wasn't even thinking about. Yeah, you know, I, I, I was feel like, that that's too. my story there. The rest of it's not my story. Right. I mean, your story, truly, I, from an objective point of view, when I when I look at Susanna Cahalan's timeline, I'm like, her story really started when she came out of the hospital. I love, I, I love that. Thank you oh, for that. Of course, yeah. absolutely. Um, I definitely want to make sure people get their questions in, but I just have one last one for you. Who is Susanna now and what is she working on? <laughs> Well, I am a mom of twins. They're three years old. And um, I'm like, like I'm, I was, I'm actually writing, there's a 10 year anniversary of Brain on Fire coming out next, in November. So there's going to be a new edition of it coming out. I'm writing a afterward right now. And I'm like, I'm entering middle age. I'm like, and I wrote that. I was like, oh my God, I guess I am. A- anyway, so that's what's happening. Um, and I, you know, I'm like, I really... I, I really just like live a life where I just really, you know, knock on wood and all my superstitions about never having a life that was like as chaotic as the time that I was sick. And that's basically my goal. Um, I, I wrote another book called The Great Pretender, which came out in 2019, which was, uh, thank you. Um, and that was, that's about, that goes into, you know, I was after my book came out, Brain on Fire came out. I was inundated with a lot of um, people who had my illness, who had other illnesses, but then there was another group and perhaps even larger group of people who did not have um, neurological or organic illness like we do, but had something that was deemed psychiatric and how they felt completely marginalized by the field, neglected, sometimes abused. And there were real lots of cries for help in that world. And I thought, look, what, what is this separation? And I found myself very adamantly putting that separation. I mean, Brain on Fire is basically an announcement like, no, mine's neurological. I wasn't, you know, I didn't lose my yeah. mind. You know? And um, I just really wanted to interrogate that and investigate that. And that um, ended up leading me into a kind of look into a modern history of psychiatry and how diagnosis has changed, how there, why there is stigma, why there are these separations. Um, I, I use that as a way of, I, I, I actually focused on um, a group of people who went undercover in psychiatric hospitals, a famous study in the 1970s, and it ends up being a mystery. And I didn't realize that when I first started it, but the book is actually a mystery. Um, so that came out since 19. I'm now working on a book. Um, I can show you my wall of- Oh, I saw, it's beautiful. Cards. Um, about, uh, it's kind of, I mean, generally about um, psychedelics, but it's about one woman who was kind of, has been kind of written out of the history of of psychedelics. And it's more than just psychedelics. It's really kind of about one woman's like kind of search for meaning um, in the 20th century and kind of really charting her path. And as a way of talking about what's going on now in in psychedelics and our greater search for meaning. So, um, So that's what I'm working on now. Oh my gosh, I can't wait. We definitely want to be up to date on your 10 year brain on fire book. Oh, thank you. I will definitely get a copy. I'm sure we will too. The others will too. Um, 
So I, I open up the floor to questions. If you have any questions for Susanna, go ahead and populate them in the chat. But you know, while we're waiting for some questions to come in, Susanna, as a as an NMO patient, an autoimmune disease patient, rare disease patient just a patient in general, a person, a friend, like an advocate. Thank you for doing what you have done. And we support you and can't wait to see you and observe your journey. It's incredible. Well, I, I have to say that um, the support that I've gotten from the community in the rare disease world has been just amazing. And, you know, you can't like say everyone who has a rare disease is incredible, but my experience with, no, people, no, I know what you mean. Yeah. You can't say that you can't, you know, but in my experience with people on the front lines of dealing with this and, um, you know, really pushing for change in a system that's designed to push back against people who are rare, mm -hmm. um, has been, I've met so many remark, remarkable, yourself included clearly. I mean, so it's, um, it's, I, I, I thank you for the support. And I just, I, I can say too, that I think Brain on Fire as the book, that, that entity would not have done what it did without the support from that community, because that's where I think it really bubbled up and then went out to the rest of the world um, or the country really, but that's where it started. And so, um, yeah, I, I mean, the book wouldn't have done what it did, what it did without that, without that support. So thank you. Oh, of course. Okay. We have a question. Can you tell us about how research and patient advocacy around your condition has evolved since your bout of illness and the release of brain on fire? Absolutely. So when I was first diagnosed again, this is 2009, there was not one organization dedicated to it. And it was extremely lonely. I remember when I was Googling, <laughs> I misheard my mom and I, and I also was not quite, you know, prepared to be able to typing, be typing, typing yet. So I wrote like MDMA, which is ecstasy, a drug. Um, <laughs> MDMA auto body. So I was like, okay, what, what I found, I don't even remember, but it must've been pretty interesting. And, but there was literally nothing except for these very esoteric papers written by, because our real, our, our version of, is it, is Levy was your, yeah. Yeah. Our version of that is actually a man named Dr. Dalmau who discovered the disease in 2005. Oh. He is that guy. Um, and so there were two papers written by Dalmau at the time. And then, you know, my husband, who was my boyfriend at the time was reading and just, you know, like, what is this? Like, it's like, you know, I, I think it's kind of terrifying for, for a lot of families to read these jur medical journals and with, populated with these words that are just in, inconceivable. So that's all we had ever. So since then, there've been a few Facebook, great Facebook um, groups that have cropped up and that are very patient focused and they're, you know, connecting patients to patients. I became involved with um, a woman um, who, her name Helen Egger, who was the head of child psychiatry at Duke, whose son had seronegative autoimmune encephalitis. And we connected and by some wild chance, another couple whose daughter passed away from autoimmune encephalitis, seronegative encephalitis, contacted me as well. As I was talking to both people, I said, oh, you're both from Durham, North Carolina. And they're like, and they're, they're like, you know, I was like, I was thinking to myself, they're both yeah. in So I said, I should connect you guys. I connected them. Their kids were on the same floor at Duke and they didn't know each other because that's how siloed everything is because of HIPAA. It took writing a woman in New York that they read her book mm -hmm. to connect someone on the same floor. So anyway, the three of us started something called the Autoimmune Encephalitis Alliance, which is still running. I am not as, as closely as involved in it anymore, but I'm I send everyone, all the people who reach out to me, I send them there. Um, we originally had, you know, amazing kind of paths to trying to get some kind of standard of care. And now there are several clinical trials going on. It kind of went up, rose above like us being able to do it kind of got out of our hands. And now there are certain clinical trials in certain areas, but I, that's why I'm so impressed by the work that you're doing that you're able to, cause it's not easy. There's a lot of different kind of personalities and a lot of different, um, kind of interests, even though interest overall interest is the same, but it was um, incredible to learn about nonprofit work and incredibly hard what I, what it was, what I learned. Um, the nonprofit world is something I'm completely unfamiliar with and getting a little bit of a, a test drive test course in it um, was 
really enlightening. And I just am so grateful for the people who are running it now and they're doing an amazing job. And they're also, I also am involved with the Encephalitis Society um, in the UK as an ambassador there. And they have really done a lo- really good, good job of, of bringing in the autoimmune version of encephalitis. Cause they were, you know, their, their brand, their encephalitis in general, which is far wider, mm-hmm. but autoimmune encephalitis, they've really kind of made a targeted effort and they have like a 24 hour hotline. People can call wow. for help and they're UK based. And I think they're coming into, in fact, I don't, I mean, is encephalitis involved with NMO at all or no? Not to my knowledge. I just feel like you guys should talk. Let's talk. Yeah, yeah. They do a good job of, and I think you just would be, you guys, your organizations would get along. That's awesome. Um, yeah, but anyway, so um, so I had a little bit of a window into like what interna- how in- internationally nonprofits look, look. So that was interesting for me, but they've expanded so much and they're doing so much great work that was not really available when I was sick. So that's a long way of saying it's changed dramatically since when I was first diagnosed and and the kind of landscape of being able to go now on Facebook and finding other people immediately who have that, um, have the same, have the same thing has been, I think, pretty, pretty rewarding for people. Um, and pretty, and I had something that I, I wish I had had, um, when I was was sick. Yeah. So true. And so relatable. I remember, but I say, I tell people all the time now, like when I got diagnosed in 2014, there were already three other organizations in existence. And they were doing great work, but as a newly diagnosed young woman, I was looking for something that didn't exist. Like medically, I was being taken care of, but what about my heart? Like, what about my feelings? Like, what about just, you know, all of that stuff that my doctors couldn't really address, right? Because that's not their job. And that's when I was like, all right, fine. I guess I'll just make it myself. (laughs) I think it's, I think it's essential. Yeah, it is. It is. And it's, I remember, you know, anyone who had, especially in those early days when I was really searching for connections, anyone who had it, I would just, you know, please call me, you know, and I just wanted, I just want to talk to people. And I know that there's still a major urge um, for people to just connect with other, which is amazing that you're doing this event to connect people because I, so in the encephalitis uh, alliance, they do a yearly run in honor of the of the of the beautiful young girl named Florence who passed away, called Florence Fourth, in March Fourth in in uh, North Carolina. And I, I went there, I think, five or six times for their family um, their event to actually run the race. And then they did a family um, gathering, and it would it was all people who had autoimmune encephalitis and their caregivers. And I can't even like the, it was like you could like feel how charged up everyone was to be in the same room, how much it meant to everyone, how yeah. like it was just galvanizing and everyone was in different stages. Some people were initially were just diagnosed and they, you know, they had the steroid phase and they, you know, couldn't really communicate yet. And then there were people who, like me who had been, you know, diagnosed very early on and had recovered or some people who hadn't recovered. It was the whole gamut. Um, and it was really meaningful and powerful. So wow. I, I, I'm so glad you, you all, you guys are, will be doing that soon. It's amazing. Oh, thank you. Okay. Someone's question. How many variations of NMDA autoimmune have been identified since your case was brought to the attention of the medical community? I would say when I was first diagnosed, there was anti-NMDA. I think there's over 20 now, uh, maybe more, maybe 30. Last time I had a, I mean, I can, if you're interested, I, I do have a list somewhere and I can email it to you, but sure. um, the last one, I think the last time I checked up on this was, well, you, was several years ago. And I think it was about 20. So there must be more now. Wow. And there also is like the, the real push for zero negative as well. Um, which wow. is, which is really being investigated at Mayo. That's incredible. Thank God for people like, or institutions like Mayo. Yeah. Um, has your experience with autoimmune encephalitis led you to focus more on healthcare as a subject of your work? Or after writing your book, have you perhaps understandably preferred to focus on other topics? I have to say, I think it's, you know, it's I'm, get, I'm moving further and further away a bit, um, but it's always going to be there. You know, my second book was about psychiatry. You know, that was still very much, I'm very... Sorry, there's a dog barking. Okay. (laughs) um, There was, uh, sorry, I just got it. My son was diagnosed with NMDA and NMO. Um, Anyway, sorry. Oh, wow. Since I I would love to hear about that. Yeah. 
Um, but so this next book is a kind of step away, but I just know I'll always have a foot in medicine. I, there's so anything there, there's all of narrative, anything you'd want from narrative is contained within medicine. You know, you have drama, you have science, you have personalities, yeah. you, have animation, you have, I mean, you have it all. So you have it all. And I also just think it's just, I mean, it's, it's just, it's, it's fascinating. It's important. It's um, yeah, no, I, I, I see myself always going back to this. I don't know if there'll be times when I inch a little bit further away, but they will always be kind of drawing me back in. I think. I'm sure. Throughout your encounters with Dr. Arsla, you rated your progress on a scale of up to 100. How accurate do you feel those representations were at the time? If you had to answer that now, what would your answer be? That's a great question. So interesting. I was like, who's Dr. Arslan? I changed his name in, in the book because oh. I changed a lot of names of people who maybe I actually gave him the opportunity. I said, do you want to change your name? Have your name changed? Yeah. And he wanted to have his name changed. He changed it to lion. I think it means lion. Um, but anyway, but um, I did not have a good sense of where I was. I would always say that I was close to 100 and I was nowhere near that at the time. So I've proven, and, and, and I think I've honestly, did I really believe it? No, probably not. It's hard to like, I felt I really, I'm, I'm so good. I'm good, you know? Yeah. Um, so I'm proven to be a absolutely terrible judge of my own cognition and my own status of like where I am. And, but um, so I, I, I would say that um, I'm 100% <laughs> now, I would say that without, hesitating. And I think the real question would be for my family who always had a better sense of that than I did. And I think they would say that too. Um, I, I kind of think that um, when I was writing Brain on Fire, it was interesting because when I wrote the first draft or no, when I wrote the proposal, it was kind of circulated. A lot of books get circulated among kind of um, which, like people who are, what are they called? Oh, like headhunters kind of, but they're like four publishing in Hollywood and all that stuff. And someone had read my proposal and then read my first draft. And she told, I, re, I met her and she said, there was a, like a dramatic improvement in like in the writing between those two. Oh, wow. So I was definitely writing my way through recovery at that point. And so I think like in some ways, I don't think I'd be, have, would have been capable of writing the great pretender without everything that I have, but what I have now is what I have now. Yeah. Maybe it isn't what it was then, but it, in some ways it doesn't, for me, for my personality and myself, it doesn't behoove me to think that way. It's like, this is what I have now. I'm terrible with names. I have a horrible memory. I'm really frazzled. I'm like forgetful and messy and et cetera. I've kind of always been a lot of those ways, but like I would, maybe they've gotten worse and maybe those are kind of scars from being sick, but I don't really think of it that way because we all, none of us are perfect and we all deal with various things. And so I try to think, I try not to go down the path, like my imperfections are because of that, because, right. and I'm, I'm not saying that you shouldn't, because people should take full, like be fully capable of getting help and, you know, saying, I have this, this is something that I need to work with and I need help working with that. They, but I don't feel like I have that you know, personally, I feel like I am back. And so I try, I, maybe it's the, the denialism that came back from, I came during that Dr. Arslan kind of interaction when I'd always say I was hundred percent. So I don't know if this is just denial speaking, but I don't like, I don't like to think about the fact that my brain is different, but it is, you know, anyway, I'm babbling now, but no, no. I mean, I think these are all very relatable thoughts. We've, I think we've all sort of been there. All right. We have time for two more questions. So uh, the next one is, do any patients with your condition ever have a relapse or second episode? Do you consider yourself cured or in remission or in some other category? Great question. Yes. Relapse rate. When I was first diagnosed, I think relapse rate were about 30%. So high. Lots of people were relapsing. Part of that had to do with the fact that things were not being aggressively treated in the first place. So again, to go back to that fire metaphor, it was a kind of smoldering that was never fully put out. Um, with more aggressive treatment and earlier intervention, I think they're at like a 15% relapse rate. A lot of people I speak to get have relapses though. Um, I did not have a relapse. 
it's yeah, it's something that I think about not all the time when I was pregnant, I was definitely thinking about it there. I had an anniversary of my seizure, which happened on Friday the 13th of 2009. And I had an anniversary of that. And I didn't, it was like the first time I'd almost forgotten about the anniversary, but then I remembered and I was like, I should probably be like freaked out, you know? So I, it's still like that, that question is still lurking uh, to be quite honest. Um, the question of like, am I where, what status am I? It's like so smart the way you ask that, because I, I think I am on a third category. I don't think it's remission because I don't think from what the physicians I've talked to have said and the researchers, there's no like five years and you're good. It seems like something you just live with. There's like, there, it could come back. Like it's, it does seem like the further out you go, maybe the less likely it is that it does, but it's never like you go to zero, uh, you know? And again, there's no natural history of the illness really yet. So it's hard to say, but that's, that's basically the response that I've gotten when I'm trying to get them to tell me like, you're cool, you're fine. And they just won't tell me that because, you know, there have been cases of people, even in the past, I mean, these, there are wild stories of uh, women who have, I've talked to who are in their 80s, who told me that they had some kind of nervous breakdown when they were in their 20s, and then like, then had a re, had what would be a relapse. I mean, they, they weren't diagnosed at the time, just kind of went, kind of the smoldering kind of went away on its own, because that sometimes happens with this illness. Then it came back when they're 80s. So you know, it's never, you're never fully out of the woods. And, you know, if you deal with rare diseases, who's out of the woods of a rare disease, really? No one. You're so right. Oh man, we have so many good questions. I want to be respectful of your time. So I'll try to get through them quickly. Do you have any parting thoughts, suggestions for TSF Ooh. regarding what you feel patient communities need more of in terms of support and addressing gaps slash deficits in how our healthcare system currently works? Well, I think the number one thing that you're doing is the knowledge is like passing along. Okay. What kind of specifically, how do you deal with insurance companies with this? Mm -hmm. Because I'm like there, that's a big question that I get a lot is people are not approved for IVIG therapy because it's, because it's very expensive or how do you, you know, how do you get IVIG at home, you know, instead of having right. to go in the hospital, I mean, really kind of specific questions like that, as much as you can help people with the bureaucratic nonsense that they have to go through, the more they can concentrate on healing and, mm -hmm. you know, their own sanity and well-being during a very highly emotionally and physically fraught time. So I think, you know, as much as that kind of very specific and um, necessary and an essential kind of conversation around how do we get the best care that you can get, uh, is key. I mean, a big question I get all the time are doctors who have had experience with autoimmune encephalitis. I'm sure you have a list of NMO doctors. Yeah. That in and of itself is probably like a golden resource for people. Because as you know, as having navigated this world without that, it's like you just are waiting to find that one person who can be like, oh, yeah, totally. it's this. Totally. It takes them five minutes. Totally. So the fact that you can shorten people's paths there you know, unfortunately, how do they know? You know, it's like, it, it, you know, there's a lot of people doing their own digging. And if you can, you have this infrastructure in place where someone can actually land on you and find a way and look and say, oh, these are doctors in my area that have had experience with it. That can be everything to someone that can save someone's life. So I think, you know, so kind of practically that's key, but I, I mean, you know, just from what you said, the heart and, you know, kind of the spiritual side of this and what it's like to, live with, you know, be in the kingdom of sickness as, uh, as Virginia Woolf says, which is, you know, or Susan Sontag always talks about how, you know, once you're in that land of, no one wants to go in that land. And when you're there, no one wants to be there with you really. So it's like learning how to be there and, and being with other people who are in that kingdom with you, um, and on that other side on how to navigate that in a way that, that you can, my kid crying. Um, you know, sorry, I'm like, oh, but no, I, I I feel that speaking with someone who can who's who's been there, who's literally been in the same hospital situation that you have, have had the same conversations with their family, and you can, you know, look at them and and hug them and you yeah. know call them. You know that that to me is is a precious resource too. On top of it, so. Um, beautifully said beautifully said oh this is a great last question you ready how do you go about getting a book published okay there you go 
<laughs> okay. Well, I, I'm practically, I can give you the practical steps. So, yeah. I mean, I had worked in, in journalism for a long time. So it, that does help in terms of, I think before you're thinking book, I think you want to think articles, mm -hmm. get your, get your feet wet in writing about things that you're unfamiliar with or, or even that you're familiar with, but getting published is really helpful in getting a book, book deal. It's, it's unfortunately one of the, I, I'm dealing with someone right now who's trying to get a book published, who's never been published. And I'm kind of like, I know it's hard to get, you, you, it's hard to get published and it's hard. You can't get a book deal until you get published and it's impossible to get published. Like, how do you do it? Be, you know, breaking in and getting a, a few bylines is, is key. Um, and then what I do to, a lot of people ask me this question and I say to them, find your comp books. So find your books that you feel have, are after the same audience that you are, that maybe have a similar kind of content that are your like, this is my shining star of example of a kind of book I wanna write. Gather a list of those. You can easily read the acknowledgements, find their agents. If you have a query that's like a elevator pitch that like you got a paragraph to make someone wanna to, want to read what you're gonna write, have that and send those out. That's how I got my agent is I just wow. send them cold emails. Um, and I think um, kind of that's where you start. And with nonfiction, you um, sell on proposal. So in the case of Brain on Fire, I wrote um, like about a 60 page proposal. I can go through those specifics, but basically it's an overview of sample chapter, a couple sample chapters, et cetera. And then you're kind of off to the races at that point. Then they, they send it to publishers and either publishers pass or they make an offer. And in my case, only one made an offer, but, um, but in other cases, people have bidding wars and stuff. So that's the publishing, that's my, two second kind of take but I think the number one thing is to think like think about your audience like how like who do you want to be reading this do you, is this like in the community or is this outside of the community um and I think it's 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 really important to be reading like reading um books that you feel are examples that you can kind of I, sometimes in certain pieces of nonfiction that I feel are really well done I'll actually map them it's like, how was this structured and how did this person tell us how did this person pulled this off? And you kind of, that's can, can be very helpful too. Wow. You're the illest, you're the chillest. Oh. Thank you for being here. We <laughs> are so much. lucky to have met you today. Oh, well, I'm so lucky to, to have met, well, I'm, I'm lucky to have met you and I'm just really impressed by what you're doing with the foundation. And um, I'm a big fan of the foundation. Oh, Susanna. You, so thank you. I can't wait to meet you next, in a few weeks, actually. I know. It's only going to be, it's only two weeks away. So I, it's, I'll give you, a, I'm going to give you a big hug when I see you. So oh, you. I can't wait. But no, this was incredible. I learned so much. I, I think our audience really appreciated it too. And like, yeah, kind of what I said earlier, just we support you. Keep doing what you're doing. You're changing lives with every letter that you imprint on a, <laughs> on a page. Um, you changed my life. I think you changed a lot of lives today. People who read your work, they saw the movie, you know, whatever. You're, 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 uh, you're like a comet. Oh, <laughs> I want that on my gravestone. Okay, thank you uh, for that. I'm taking that. <laughs> Like a comment. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. All right. All right. Well, thank you. Take care. We love you. Right. Bye. Bye. Bye.